The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a very nice show lined up for you today. In about 20 minutes, we'll be joined by Mark Chaikin, founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics. Chaikin Analytics is behind two Index IQ ETFs. These both launched last year, the IQ Chaikin U.S. Large Cap ETF and the IQ Chaikin U.S. Small Cap ETF. Chaikin Analytics runs the indexes for both of these ETFs. And they use a pretty interesting methodology. Mark has built a 20-factor model. It's a quantitative model. It's called the Chaikin Power Gauge. This combines four broad factors, so value, growth, technical, and sentiment, with the overall goal being to beat the market. And look, there are a lot of buzzwords here, but the bottom line is this gauge looks at everything from earnings growth to free cash flow to recent stock price trends to determine which stocks the index will own. As a side note, Mark himself has some 50 years of experience as a Wall Street analyst, a stockbroker, and an options expert. But Jason, these ETFs, I, I think, are yet, yet another classic example of the automation of active management. And, and you know, if you look at the, the numbers, investors are taking to these ETFs. There's already over a half a billion dollars invested in these. It's an interesting product. We're going to lift up the hood and take a take a look inside with Mark. But as a side note to that, the other side of the coin, you know, index invest of passive investing, the uh, granddaddy of them all, the S&P 500 ticker SPY just hit the quarter century mark 25 years ago. The first ETF was founded uh, investing around the S&P 500. Um, I was thinking as we were going to visit with Mark about our discussion, think about when the SPY was was founded and what you would have had to have done as an individual investor back then to replicate some of these quantitative active management replacement strategies that we're going to talk about today. And I'm thinking to myself, it had to have been a separate account or perhaps a mutual fund. It certainly would have been a black box. You wouldn't really know the moving parts inside. Yeah, really not available to retail investors in any way, shape, or form. Not even close. Not even close. And what would you be paying for it? You know, a percent, two percent. It's just, it's it's amazing. Some of the strategies we'll be just talking about today can be had for you know less than 30 or 40 basis points. So really amazing. But another side to this real proliferation of active management replacement strategies, I, I call it an, an education or an adoption gap. You know, as we peel back the layers of the onion, these strategies are not for the faint of heart. And I know you and I have done a deep dive on some of these ETFs, but for the for the uh, you know average retail investor, there while the opportunity is unbelievable to put some of these strategies in your portfolio. These are not easy to get your arm around like the S&P 500 might be. So that'll be a great discussion. No, absolutely. One of the areas I want to be sure to touch on with Mark is how investors can best evaluate all of the different factors ETFs uh, that are out there. Because this is a growing area of the ETF market, but with more options available, and in some cases, pretty complicated options, this can get a bit confusing for investors. So we'll be sure to discuss that with Mark as well. Again, he'll join us in about 20 minutes. Later in the show, we'll have our usual weekly market update. Last week was the worst week for stocks since 2016. We saw that carry over to the markets yesterday. We'll tell you what happened, and we have a few thoughts on what you might expect moving forward. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can email us at advice at etfstore.com, or you can find us on Twitter at ETF Store. All right, so the ETF flow data from January has come in. And look, I know we talk a lot about ETF growth on this show, 
But what's different recently is this growth is beginning to accelerate. The pace of flows is actually increasing. New money invested into ETFs in January totaled around $70 billion. And I know data doesn't always translate on radio and podcasts, but I want to try and provide at least a little context here. In 2016, ETFs took in nearly $288 billion for the entire year. And that was a record at the time. Again, that was $288 billion in 2016. Last year, ETFs obliterated that record. They took in $476 billion. And if you do the math on that, that was around 65% more in net flows in 2017 than in 2016. If January's pace were to hold for the entire year this year, you're looking at like $850 billion dollars which would be a nearly 80% increase from last year. Now, you always have to be careful extrapolating data forward, right? We're only one month into the year. Of course, we don't know what the rest of the the year will look like, especially in the markets. But Jason, just looking at the trend line here, ETF growth is starting to hockey stick. It's accelerating. And for all the talk about how great ETFs are and how they're lighting the world on fire, Guess what? The flows are actually backing it up. It's not just bluster. It isn't. It's it's far beyond arithmetic growth. We are at the geometric phase where it, it truly is a hockey stick. And, you know, Nate, we're accused oftentimes of speaking in hyperbole about some of the benefits and uh, of ETFs and investing this way. And, and certainly the flows, it's 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 um, it's amazing. But it is what it is. I mean, these facts are are, are mind boggling. And even in our shop, when we, when these numbers come out, I mean, our eyebrows go up. It's just, it's hard to fathom how fast this is occurring in, in some of the flows. Um, to be clear, we have to separate market performance and flow data. So what we're not, you know, last year was a great year for the market. And so all, you know, the a rising tide will lift all boats. What we're talking about is what people are doing with their money. Where is it coming from or out of, and where is it going? And clearly, um, it's moving into ETFs. But let's talk more about the market growth aspect, because the numbers I provided are just net new flows. They don't include market growth. But look, there's no question the performance of the market helps, right? When the markets are going up, more people want to put money to work. If you actually include market growth last year, total ETF assets grew by $870 billion compared to the $476 billion in net flows. But here's what I would tell you. Just look over to mutual funds. So while ETFs are growing at an accelerating rate, mutual funds have really been struggling. There was a great stat provided at the uh, Inside ETFs conference we attended a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Inside ETF CEO Matt Hogan, he said that since the financial crisis in 2008, ETFs have taken in nearly $2 trillion in new money. Believe it or not, mutual funds have actually lost money over that time period. So what that tells you is, yes, investors want exposure to a rising stock market. There's no question that helps, but they're preferring to get that exposure through ETFs. When we see markets rise, the, the animal spirits come out, which that's 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 investing. That's capitalism. That's a neat thing to see. But you're right. People have a choice as to how to get that exposure to whatever particular market they're looking for. ETFs, mutual funds, individual stocks, bonds, exchange traded debt. The list goes on and on. Let me for a second put away my cheerleader pom poms. It, it just remind everyone that ETFs and other vehicles are just a means to an end. They're investment vehicles. It's a way to get access to whatever market that you want exposure to. I mean, here's a silly example. If you want to go to the the grocery store, you can walk, you can drive, you can call Uber, call your mom, take the train, bike, hitchhike, walk. You know, which one will you use? Well, whatever makes the most sense, whatever, you know, in your for your particular situation. It really doesn't matter what your neighbor is doing. It's what I need for my situation. So we always want to keep that in mind. And, and for our shop, to be clear, Many of our clients have exposure through multiple vehicles, individual stocks and bonds, exchange-traded debt, and, and, and really other – there are a lot of different tools we use. If, if we determine that that's the best way to get the satellite exposure we want for that particular market and that particular client, no question about it. It's also true that the vast majority of the exposure that our clients have is through ETFs simply because – of all the benefits, the tax treatment, the expenses, all the things we talk about regularly on the show. So 
it's a means to an end. But I am proud that you know years ago when we began our research and due diligence about the market and changes and ETFs and really this revolution, we were ahead of the curve. So that's a neat thing. We every once in a while we'll pat ourselves on the back. All right. So here is the trillion dollar question. When the market finally experiences a significant pullback, which it will at some point. Right. Yep. Okay. Does that change these trends? Do investors go back to using mutual funds when the market is down 30%? Or will we continue to see the bulk of new money going into ETFs? And look, I certainly don't want to see a 30% market downturn. But I've got to tell you, I'm very interested to see what flows look like when we finally do have one. It's an amazing thought experiment because we have been through this eight, nine, almost 10 year run bull markets where, you know, everything worked. The market went up. And so what will change? Um, Let me throw out some ideas, just some things that people should be thinking about. Will people go to cash if we see the big one, the 30, the 40, the 50 percent decline? I think some will. I mean, I do know some people that have lost half their money twice since 2000. And that's not a good thing. And they don't want to be they don't want to have that happen a third time, you know, 18 years later. So th- certainly that'll happen. Will people go back to mutual funds from ETFs? My opinion is this was a one way to ride. You know, th- there it's just unless there were some sort of change in the tax code or some fundamental change in the industry that, that leveled the playing field for mutual funds, maybe we might see that. And you know, we might that we might jump on the bandwagon. Who knows? But. You know, barring that, I, I just can't see that really happening. Um, what will happen to flows overall? Will they go up? Will they go down, regardless of where they're coming from or going to? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, we all want to retire. We all want to build a nest egg for the future. So regardless of market conditions, we're going to have to save. So maybe there may be some differences between institutional investors and retail investors. But... What the, the question that I really ponder about is what are the, the, the people that still have positions in mutual funds now, existing shareholders, what will they do? Will they continue to hold their positions? Certainly there are some reasons to keep an existing mutual fund position. You may have taxable gains. There may be some uh, – you have an extremely niche product that isn't yet available in the ETF wrapper. You know, So there are some reasons why that may happen. I think that if we were to see a major pullback – there would probably be even more impetus to look around and what am I paying in fees and and how is this structured? Simply because in a declining market, they stand out. It's a sore thumb. Whereas in a rising market, you know, a rising market can hide a lot of sins, including expenses and fees. So if that environment were to change, I think there would be a, an added emphasis on, on expenses. But again, at the end of the day, it'll come down to performance. That seems to drive the bus. Um, you know, make no mistake, we're watching it. The industry is watching it. This will be a a, a, biz, a Harvard business case study <laughs> in, in investor behavior if we were to see that sort of market sentiment change. Well, we need to take a break here. But like you were saying earlier, let's be very clear. ETFs and mutual funds, they are simply investment vehicles, right? They're, they're just ways to help you access the financial markets. And ultimately, as an investor, This shouldn't be an ETF versus mutual fund battle. What's most important is accomplishing whatever goals you have uh, within your portfolio. You should be most concerned with the underlying strategies and the asset class exposure and certainly things like fund fees and tax efficiency. Uh, Just because ETFs are sort of the cool kids on the block right now, that doesn't guarantee investment success. On the other hand, you can't just ignore what's happening here. The fact is $2 trillion plus has gone into ETFs since the financial crisis. Well, net money has come out of mutual funds. That's real investors voting with real dollars. So look, we are the ETF store. Everybody knows we love ETFs. I get it. But what I would tell you is just look at the data. Don't take our word for it. Just look at the data. And I think it's important to ask yourself why these trends are occurring. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Mark Chaikin, founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics. We're going to discuss the methodology behind two Index IQ ETFs. Both are powered by Chaikin Analytics. These ETFs launched last year, and already they have north of a half a billion dollars in assets, so very successful launches. We're going to look under the hood of both of these ETFs right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show.
Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature Racing and Jason Lincoln Studio. Our guest today is Mark Chaikin, founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics. Mark has some 50 years of experience as a Wall Street analyst, a stockbroker, and an options expert. And his firm, Chaikin Analytics, has built a unique methodology that powers two index IQ ETFs, the IQ Chaikin U.S. Large Cap ETF, ticker symbol CLRG, and the IQ Chaikin U.S. Small Cap ETF, ticker symbol CSML. Both of these ETFs launched last year, the Large Cap ETF in December, and it has already crossed over $100 million uh, invested in it. And then the Small Cap ETF launched last May. It has over $400 million invested in it, so both very successful new ETFs. Mark is joining us via phone today from Philadelphia. Mark, our pleasure to have you on the program. Nate, it's great to be with you, and you just played one of my favorite Rolling Stones songs. Is that in honor of what's going on in the market, or is that a theme song? <laughs> hey, that's both in honor of what's going on in the markets and uh, hopefully for New England Patriots fans as well. I'd love to hear what's <laughs> going on in the ground uh, on, in Philadelphia following the Super Bowl. Thursday is going to be wild. Our offices are right on the Super Bowl parade route, so we'll be able to see it with an unimpeded view from our 18th uh, story uh, office. Well, congratulations. Hey, Mark, first just tell us a little bit about Shaken Analytics and perhaps how you ended up partnering with Index IQ. I started Shaken Analytics with my wife in 2009 after the financial collapse of 08. And my goal was to go way beyond technical analysis, which is what I was known for, and build a predictive model based on what I learned in 35 years of working with successful buy-side active mutual fund, and hedge fund managers. Uh, we're now 26 people in Philadelphia. In 2010, after a year's worth of research, we locked down our model that's called the Chaikin Power Gauge Rating. This is a multi-factor model that looks at value, growth, technical, and sentiment factors, 20 factors in all. The weights were locked down in 2010 in September. All the factors are the same, so we're not chasing alpha by tinkering with the model, and we made it available both to uh, individual investors and to advisors uh, beginning in 2011. And then in 2014, NASDAQ, after doing a serious due diligence on the power gauge rating, said we'd like you to create three NASDAQ Chaikin indices based on our large cap 300, our small cap 1500, and our dividend achievers index. Those sub-indices went live on April 1st of 2014. They're rebalanced annually, and they've significantly outperformed their benchmarks since their launch. All right, Mark, so there are currently two Index IQ ETFs using uh, the indexes you built. Again, the IQ Chaikin U.S. Large Cap ETF and the IQ Chaikin U.S. Small Cap ETF. Let's start with the index for the Large Cap ETF Walk us through the, the, the detailed methodology here. If this is meant to be a top-down, rules-based, disciplined methodology to create the index, uh, we start with the NASDAQ 300, which are the 300 largest stocks in the S&P 500. We then say that if they have a very positive rating in our model, meaning they're in the top uh, decile based on the power gauge rating using the Russell 3000 as core universe, uh, they automatically make it into the sub-index. Now, NASDAQ put just two uh, constraints on us. A, because they rebalance their indices annually, the NASDAQ Chaikin indices that underlie the uh, large-cap ETF are rebalanced annually. And B, they wanted at least 15% of the constituents, so in the case of the large-cap, at least 45 stocks from the 300 to flow down. Uh, in order to satisfy that 15% requirement. And by the way, this year there are 53 stocks in the index, uh, which will be reconstituted on April 1st going forward. Um, in order to get to that 15% threshold, we do a value screen. We screen on price to book, looking for the cheapest stocks in the NASDAQ 300. And then we require that the power gauge rating be bullish. So key point here is if a stock has a bearish rating in our multi-factor model, it can't make it into the index. That immediately puts the wind at your back because the model has proven itself as effective in identifying 
stocks that are likely to underperform as well as stocks that are likely to outperform. So this year we ended up with 53 names, and we then equally weight the index. And I think that's very critical because uh, once you've gone through this rules-based discipline methodology, if you then play God and say this stock should be twice the weight as that stock, I believe that you're defeating the whole purpose of this rules-based uh, um, objective approach. Mark, this is Jason Lank. Welcome to the show. Um, while it's a 20-factor model, they seem to fall under four basic categories, value, technical growth, and sentiment. Could you walk us through each of those four and just, just for the listener describe the basic concept behind each of those? Yeah, I'm happy to, Jason, and, and good to be with you. Uh, I work with institutional investors for 35 years, teaching them how to use technical analysis. In order to do my job well to sell my product, I had to learn what they were looking at every day. And we had clients that ran the gamut from value investors in the uh, Philadelphia Mid-Atlantic region, like Delaware Management, dividend-oriented, Miller Anderson, sort of value-oriented, to very growth-oriented managers up in Boston and New York. Common theme was, even though they had different styles and time horizons, they were successful active fund managers. I heard you talking earlier about active mutual funds. Well, these were the people running the successful active mutual funds at Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, like Mason, Invesco, and so forth. So when I tried to make some sense out of what they were looking at in creating the power gauge rating, I divided things into these four primary factors. So the value metrics are 35% of the model. And the two most important factors within the value component, free cash flow to market cap and price to sales ratio. So if that sounds like Warren Buffett or uh, Rob Arnott, who runs Rafi, the four-factor model, it should because that's what they look at. In fact, if you've been watching CNBC over the last couple of days, what have they been talking about? Companies with good balance sheets. So free cash flow to market cap, very important metric. In the growth factors, we're looking at some traditional factors, uh, but what we really cherish is earnings consistency because companies that report consistent earnings as opposed to the ones that jump up and down, uh, you know, sort of trying to get your attention with big earnings increases are really the factor uh, that, that matters. And then we look at earnings surprises, how a company does relative to Wall Street estimates under the theory that earnings surprises – come in bunches. I learned this when I was at Drexel Burnham in the mid-80s from George Douglas, who did the original research in earnings surprise and earnings estimate revisions. So earnings surprises persist for quarter after quarter after quarter until finally the trend is over. So we've got sort of the bedrock value metrics, 35% of the model. Then we've got some more sensitive factors, but ones that persist over time. The technicals are only 15% of the model. And then we think the sentiment factors are our secret sauce because these factors are not included in your typical quantitative model that's been built by a Nobel Prize winner or an academic. These are the factors that drive Wall Street stock prices. What I like to say is that the model works because it's based on how Wall Street works. So in sentiment, we have short interest. High short interest is potentially negative for the stock because short sellers do great research. We look at insider buying. And insider buying is a great tell, particularly in the small cap space, but also in large caps. And then finally, we look at industry group relative strength. So uh, the sentiment factors are sort of non-conventional models. A quant that's recently got his PhD from MIT probably isn't focusing on this type of metric or factor when he's building a model. I think that's what differentiates us, Jason, from uh, the other quant models that are out there. A follow-up to that, each of the four main overall categories has an assigned percentage. How did you come about that? Was that a regression analysis? Was that just someone's best idea? Why value at 35 instead of 30 or 40? Uh, I did what's known as an empirical uh, back test project for over a year. So no regression analyses. This is in, in the same sense that the factors uh, were called out looking at what successful active managers look at. I basically iterated it as if each factor was a standalone factor and looked at what the predictive 
uh, value of that was, more of an IC coefficient than a regression analysis. And the weight sort of fell out of that. So value metrics like price to sales and free cash flow to market cap turn out to be your best predictors of future price performance. But because you don't want to fall into a value trap, you want to combine them with the growth and sentiment factors and then a little bit of technicals just to sort of sand the edges of the model. So uh, I'll go back to what I said in the uh, beginning of, of this segment. This is a model that works because it's based on how Wall Street works. And we actually think, Jason, that we're bridging the gap between active and passive management. We're looking at the factors that successful active managers look at every day and then put them into an index that's equally weighted and then into an ETF wrapper that encapsulates all the tax efficiencies and the liquidity uh, that we've come to love about ETFs. So uh, equal weighting is a key. That, that's a, a sort of strategic data um, approach that we like. And uh, the fact that we're annually rebalancing it is also very important. So we're not as affected by these fluctuations that we've seen in the market over the last few days. Don't have to worry about that because the index will take care of that on April 1st. Our guest today is Mark Chaikin, founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics. He's behind the indexes for two index IQ ETFs. Mark, the other ETF is the IQ Chaikin U.S. Small Cap ETF, again, ticker symbol CSML, which, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, this ETF launched in May of last year, and it has already crossed over $400 million invested in it. Highly successful launch. But, Mark, is the index methodology the same here as with the large cap version, uh, just a different universe of stocks? Uh, it's very similar. There's one change that I'll highlight. I might point out that the large cap is up over $200 million in assets as of uh, about 10 o'clock today. So uh, advisors who have been looking at the small cap ETF, seeing the good performance, have started to embrace the large cap. The difference in the index creation methodology is that instead of screening for uh, price to book to get up to that 15% uh, Slow down, we're screening on price to sales. So in the small cap space, price to sales is more important than price to book. So to get to what this year was 233 stocks equally weighted on April 1st of 2017, uh, we allowed everything into the index that was in the top decile based on the power gauge rating. And then to get that 75% of the way there, to get the rest of the way there, we screen based on the lowest quintile of price to sales, meaning you're buying a dollar of revenue as cheaply as possible in that 1500 stock universe. And by the way, the NASDAQ 1500 has a 0.991 correlation to the Russell 2000. So whereas many of your listeners haven't heard NASDAQ 1500, they have heard of the IWM or the Russell 2000. And once we've screened for price to sales, again, must have a bullish shake in power gauge rating to make it into the index. This screens out a lot of those stocks in the Russell 2000 or the NASDAQ 1500 that have no earnings. So I don't know if you've talked about this on the show, but a third of the stocks in the Russell 2000 earn no money. They can't benefit from the tax cuts, and they tend to have a difficult time getting a bullish rating in our multi-factor model. So, Mark, if we were to boil this down for our listeners, where do these multi-factor strategies fit in a portfolio? Do you view these as core holdings, as replacements to market cap-weighted strategies? I think they're an excellent replacement for market weight uh, strategies. And we've all heard on the recent uh, upswing in the market uh, how buying a market cap a large cap index is really making a momentum bet on six or seven very successful large cap stocks like Amazon and Apple, Google, and so forth. This is sort of an antidote to that. So we think that this is a core holding, but that it can be used to replace. It's really a blend. So it's, it's small cap and large cap blend, so blend of growth and value. And we believe that this is a good candidate to replace these market-weighted indexes, which have underlying momentum risk or factor bet risk. You know, in other words, what's done well usually has done well because it falls into a bucket of high momentum, high growth, or what have you. We think this is an excellent replacement for market cap-weighted indices. 
as investors consider these strategies, just given the sheer number of factor-based ETFs that have come to market, I think it can be difficult to differentiate between the strategies and, and really in some cases just understand the strategies altogether. Are there a few tips you might offer to investors to help them sift through uh, the, these ETFs? What should they be looking for? Well, I think the underlying model or factor or approach has to pass the smell test. So free cash flow to market cap makes sense. If a company is generating free cash flow, they're in a healthy situation. If you pay too much for a dollar of revenue, that's price to sales ratio, you're on a high wire without a safety net. So better to buy stocks with low price to sales. So I think that the uh, approach that people are evaluating has to make sense in the real world. It can't be some theoretical model built by, you know, a, a newly minted PhD. That's what it got us in trouble in 2008 with the uh, mortgage-backed security collapse. It also got us in trouble in 1998 when long-term capital management, which was depending on models that were built by Nobel Prize winners, blew up. This is a model built by a 50-year Wall Street professional looking at what successful investors look at. If the factors make sense, then, and of course the performance, and we've got a four-year index, live index track record that, that bears out the approach, if the approach makes sense and the performance is there, then I think investors can be comfortable committing capital to a particular vehicle. Mark, Jason, again, I want to ask you really kind of a thought experiment. I'm always curious when we visit with people about some of the ideas that maybe have been researched but haven't come to market. This particular, the the power model is a long only. You're looking for the best of the best that, that meet all the criteria. Does it work on the short side? Can I short the worst of the worst? And if that side of the equation works too, when does the Chaik and Long Short ETF come out? Uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question, Jason. Yes, it does work on the short side. The power gauge has a history uh, over the uh, six years that it's been live, seven years now, of identifying stocks that have significant risks, stocks like Chipotle at 700 or the auto parts stocks in April last year or Under Armour, which has had a bearish rating for 18 months. So we're actually running a pilot hedge fund in Switzerland. Uh, it's publicly traded. Uh, vehicle and the, um, the power gauge rating sort of boosts the long side, but we're looking at long short strategies. The question is what vehicle to put them in. Do you put them into a 40s act fund? Do you put them into a hedge fund? Uh, a little more difficult to do it in, in an ETF because you need to actively manage, in my view, your short positions because of the volatility that we're now starting to see again. So, yes, the power gauge rating is. Probably, if you said to me, Mark, would you rather use it on the long side or the short side? I'd rather use it on the short side because for an individual, if you know what stocks to avoid and leave out of your portfolio or you have a vehicle that leverages that knowledge, you're ahead of the game. Uh, someone once said anybody can make money in a bull market just by throwing a dart at the newspaper. My response in 2000 and 15 was, that's true unless your dart happened to land on an energy stock. And <laughs> right. in, 2000, yeah, in 2014 and 15, the taken power gauge rating was bearish on the whole energy complex from large cap all the way down to small cap fracking stock. Therefore, on April 1st of 2015, when the annual rebalance was constituted, not one energy stock was in the large cap index. And almost no energy stocks were in the small cap. So that was because the power gauge rating was not just not bullish. It happened to be bearish on all of those stocks in the energy complex. That's changing now, by the way. Uh, power gauge rating has uh, turned bullish over the last four or five months on a lot of the um, refining stocks and also some of the major uh, integrated oil stocks, as well as some of the fracking stocks. Mark, we have about two minutes left here before we let you go. I would be interested in hearing your views on active management. Obviously, these index IQ strategies are rules-based, but as you mentioned earlier, they're really a hybrid between active and passive. How do you view active management just in terms of its ability to add value? Well, one of the uh, sort of interesting facts that is not publicly uh, sort of uh, zeroed in on is the fact that active managers historically have done well in a period of rising interest rates. 
Uh, so we've been in a period of falling interest rates now for 10 years since the financial collapse. In theory, active managers should do better. Now, in the small cap space, the problem is that successful active managers run into a capacity issue and close down so that the good managers aren't available for new investment. I think that uh, going forward, what you were talking about earlier, active managers charge higher fees. There's the liquidity issue. And I think that this trend away from actively managed mutual funds, A, because of the fees, and B, because most of them have underperformed their benchmarks, will continue. So I think that uh, while there's a place for active ETFs, uh, they haven't yet gained traction because of the transparency issue and some of the best active managers don't want the world knowing what they're doing. So I think this trend toward passive or what we're doing, which bridges the gap between active and passive, will continue for the for the next five to ten years. Well, Mark, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us on the program today and certainly hope to visit again down the road. Thank you. Nate, Jason, thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, having me on. That was Mark Chaikin, founder and CEO of Chaikin Analytics. And I'm going to give you two websites here. First, you can learn more about the two Index IQ ETFs by visiting indexiq.com. And then you can learn more about Chaikin Analytics by visiting chaikinanalytics.com. That's spelled C H A I K I N analytics.com. They have a really interesting website. As a matter of fact, they won last year's Benzinga Global Fintech Award for Best Trading Idea Platform or Tool. Uh, so uh, certainly worth checking that site out as well. Again, that's ChakenAnalytics.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Jason in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Last week was the worst week for stocks since 2016. The three major indexes, the S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and NASDAQ were all down in the neighborhood of 4%, with a big chunk of that coming on Friday when the Dow lost over 665 points. And then, of course, yesterday we saw the Dow down some 1,500 points at one point during the trading session. Jason, we've talked the past several weeks about how even as stocks raced out of the gate to start this year, the story right now is rising interest rates. And that's really what spooked the markets last week. And it's a bit counterintuitive in that the reason we're seeing rising rates right now is the global economy is showing some strength, which is a good thing. The concern from investors is that with a pickup in growth, we'll see inflation start to rise. And, of course, with an uptick in inflation, bond investors want to be compensated with higher interest rates. And the Fed will move to raise rates to keep the economy from overheating. The bottom line is higher rates raise borrowing costs for businesses and consumers. They impact corporate earnings. And ultimately, rising rates can become a negative for the economy and certainly for, for stocks and bonds. That said, I, I still think what we're seeing right now is is normal. It's just not something investors have had to worry about in quite some time. When you think about it, th there are 28, 29 year old investors who haven't seen a terrible market yet. You know, the last time the market really did some ugly things, they were in college. So you're right. A lot of investors just haven't. This is this is new to them, or at least it's it's it, it's been a long, long, long time for all investors. A couple of things. The kind of pullback we saw on Friday last week, is that the start of something terrible? Is that it, or, or are we is that just a, a buy the dip? I don't know. No one will know. That'll play out. But a one or two or three percent decline or move in the market is normal. It is not normal to have the absolute low volatility, just stair step climb we saw last year. That's not normal. You know, the market should be a healthy market is two steps forward, one step back. Wash, rinse, repeat. It shouldn't just be up, 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 up. So I, I think that's to keep that in mind. Secondly, I, I want to want people to avoid sticker shock. You know, the Dow is typically spoken about in points. How many points did it go up or down? But remember, there's relativity here. If the Dow is at 10,000 and you have a 600-point move, that's a big move. 
you know, we're north of 25,000 now. So a 600 point move that 15 years ago may have been a big, big, big move. It just, I don't want to say it didn't move the needle, but based on the market action we've seen over the last five years, it kind of doesn't move the needle. It's just a big, a big, it's a big explosion of activity, no question about it. I think you nailed it. It's about rising rates. And for so long, the, the dividend rate on many of your favorite blue chip stocks has been higher than the 10 year treasury. That means there's only one game in town and that's stocks. And that's what we saw for the last number of years. So as the Federal Reserve pauses and ponders about future rate hikes, is there a situation where as the, the, the 10-year, which is kind of the benchmark that people look at, could that rise above the dividend rate of some of these stocks? And what will people do about that? that I think that is, the, that is the inflection point we're looking at. You know, we just haven't seen a rising interest rate environment. I mean, the last time, I mean, let's face it, we're at the end of a 28-year bull market for bonds. Interest rates have gone down since Jimmy Carter was president with a few, you know, a few blips in between. So to me, the pace of tightening... The pace of global growth and can the Fed manage to keep all those balls in the air simultaneously to avoid any sort of major slip up? And I do want to reiterate an excellent point you made. You know, I just don't think investors have been used to seeing volatility in the market. And, you know, I would remind everybody, even after yesterday's very substantial decline, stocks are effectively flat for the year. Right. So, you know, the stock market gave back all of the gains here recently that they had accrued over the past month plus. But, uh, you have to keep things in perspective. But, you know, as it relates to rising rates, as we talked about last week, what this will all come down to is how effective the Fed and other central banks are at striking the right balance. The Fed concluded their regularly scheduled meeting last Wednesday. As expected, they did not raise interest rates, but they did strike much more of a hawkish tone. They said they expected inflation to move closer to their 2% target, and they said they were continuing to monitor inflation developments closely. It is highly likely we'll see a rate hike in March at their next meeting. Uh, as a matter of fact, Fed fund futures, uh, even after yesterday's declines, are pricing in nearly a 75% chance of a rate hike in March. But again, now comes the tricky part, right? The Fed successfully navigated the economy out of the financial crisis. Now they're going to have to manage this economic growth and uptick in inflation, and that could impact investors. Even if you ignore all of the Fed speak, it's the narrative, the narrative for so long, for so many years, has been bad news is good news. And it's counterintuitive. But if the economy is sputtering, Wall Street assumed that the Fed would be accommodative, and they were, kept interest rates low, free money, that's good for stocks. That's good for the stock market. So bad news, as is, is odd as that sounds, investors would cheer because that meant another period of time of free money. And who doesn't like free money? I think we're at an inflection point, perhaps, where the narrative is reversing itself, where good news is bad news. You know, good news is the economy is, is growing, maybe not as fast as some people would like, but that is good news. The bad news is that that means interest rates will probably rise in association with a growing economy, and that's not so accommodative for stocks. So if we're flipping from bad news is good news to good news is bad news, you know, there's going to be a tug of war between those two camps, and we'll have to see how that goes. But that's the narrative we're seeing. Incidentally, this was Janet Yellen's last meeting as the chair of the Fed. The new Fed chair, Jerome Powell, took over yesterday. So, you know, there may be a little bit of uncertainty in the market surrounding that as well. All right, quickly here, I did want to mention something that could spark additional economic growth. This could play into what we see from the Fed as well. Last Tuesday, President Trump delivered his first State of the Union uh, address. And from an investment perspective, I think outside of his victory lap on tax cuts, the most notable aspect from his speech was his infrastructure plan. He said he intends to put together a $1.5 trillion infrastructure spending package. This would target improving things like bridges and airports and roads. Here's President Trump uh, last Tuesday. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 trillion dollars for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. Every federal dollar should be leveraged by partnering with state and local governments and, where appropriate, tapping into private sector investment to permanently fix the infrastructure deficit. And we can do it. 
So, look, this is actually one of the few things both Republicans and Democrats agree on, that our nation's aging infrastructure needs to be improved. That being said, things are so polarized in Washington right now. The fact that both sides agree on infrastructure certainly doesn't guarantee anything will get done. I think especially with midterm elections coming up, I think both sides are jockeying for a position and they don't want to give the other side any uh, win, so to speak. But, Jason, this will ultimately come down to how to pay for the infrastructure plan. And, of course, we have another government shutdown battle looming uh, this week. Right, Nate. I, you know, the, the ink on this bill is barely dry, but um, or at least at least on its comments. Infra- everybody agrees that the infrastructure is aging. And to fix that, that would absolutely hire people and hire workers, and those workers will spend paychecks. That helps the economy. Certainly all the building materials, all the economic activity created – no one can 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 doubt the fact that improved productivity will help our economy grow. I mean, productivity is a part of how we calculate GDP. So it's a it's a it's a very very important thing. Ask anyone that drives a truck and and has to you know fill uh, fix a repair or repair a tire because of a pothole about what what a better road or productivity would be. But Nate, you nailed it. Um, the devil's in the details. Remind me again who's going to pay for this, which states and cities that he's going to partner with have that piggy bank ready to be cracked open. I mean, states right now are struggling with unfunded liabilities and some other issues. So I, I, like most legislation that's proposed, we'll have to see how this plays out. Well, you know, there has been talk of raising the federal gas tax to, to pay for this. But again, boy, that's a political hot potato. You know, it's raising taxes. Uh, You know, look, there's no doubt the country needs to improve its infrastructure. I I saw a report last week from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association that said, listen to this, over 54,000 of the country's nearly 613,000 bridges are structurally deficient. Whoops. And I'm sure there are, you know, plenty of other similar reports on our infrastructure out there as well. So I I do think this is something we need to focus on. Uh, But again, it's got to be paid for. And that's going to be the biggest challenge. And, uh, you know, we're adding to the deficit with the recent tax cuts. Again, we have this government shutdown looming this week. Uh, That's what this is going to boil down to. But I I will say if we can get a meaningful infrastructure plan pushed through, there could be some positive economic impact to that. All right, that'll do it for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, we have two guests for you. First, Kip Meadows, founder and CEO at Nottingham, will discuss several current ETF trends, including actively managed ETFs. And then Christian Magoon, CEO at Amplify ETFs, will spotlight the Amplify Transformational Data Sharing ETF. This is one of the new blockchain ETFs that's been getting a lot of attention. So we'll discuss everything from the investment case for blockchain to how well these ETFs offer exposure to blockchain technology. Until then, have a great week, everyone.